Okay, so uh, good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome back to the online interactive lecture series uh, that the INO project has been organizing for now for more than 15 weeks, and we are in the week 16. Uh, today, we have uh, a speaker coming from far away, uh, from Wisconsin, in fact, uh, Professor Sridhar Rao uh, Dasu, talking from University of Wisconsin, going to speak on triggering CMS physics in the uh, high luminosity LHC environment. Uh, once again, I'm sure for many of the audience today, uh, he's so well known and uh, he has of course given uh, many lectures uh, in India and he's well known both for his physics and his instrumentation and has also for his uh, articulation in giving uh, you know very, very nice talks at all levels. So I think he really doesn't require much of introduction, but I think it is my uh, present duty to say a word or two about him. He actually did his initial studies, his master's from University of Hyderabad, uh, and then went on to do his PhD from Rochester. Uh, he was at uh, SLAC uh, as research associate uh, 1988, then, then joined uh, Wisconsin way back in 1992, and uh, he's uh, here, he's there at, uh, at the same place now, and he's the chair of the physics department uh, during the 2017 and 21. I mean, he's currently the chair of physics department. Uh, uh, he won uh, the David Dexter uh, Prize uh, in 1987 while he was at Rochester, and then Villas Associate during. Uh, University of Wisconsin from 13 to uh, 15, and a fellow of American Physical Society in the year uh, 2013. Uh, as I was mentioning, uh, so before he in fact came to CMS, he was at Barber, SLD, and other collaborations, which uh, made very significant measurements, uh, you know, to basically establish the veracity of the standard model. At uh, CMS experiment, where he is very deeply involved, his research interests include the tau leptons, the Z bosons in electroweak and heat sectors, dark matter searches with mono object, object production, trigger and computing systems design, which where I think he's going to speak more about that today, and their implementation, integration, and commissioning. Uh, as you'll realize very soon, or if you know him already, uh, you, will, uh, you will realize that uh, his experimental program requires a very large scale computing and sophisticated trigger electronic system. So uh, the research and development uh, needed for putting together these systems, therefore, uh, is a truly interdisciplinary effort uh, with the both computer science and electrical engineering experts for exploring many, many new devices and new ideas in this field. So therefore, he actually runs a team uh, in physics and collaborates with computer science teams of University of Wisconsin. And he also worked on establishing the worldwide computing grid at, uh, for HEC, high energy physics uh, research there. So uh, as I already mentioned, he's a very prominent uh, uh, physicist at the uh, CMS, and uh, he held many, many professional responsibilities at, uh, at the, uh, on the CMS, including the US CMS collaboration chair during 2014 and uh, 16 and many other uh, major responsibilities, uh, both in the past and present. Uh, so with these uh, few words now, uh, I request uh, Professor Sridhar Dasu to talk this, to start his talk. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Satya. Yeah. Uh, I hope I'm audible clearly. Yes. So let's get started. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, triggering with the emphasis on uh, the kind of physics and what is what the uh, uh, technological uh, choices that we can make. Oftentimes in high energy physics, we would like to take credit for a lot of things, including uh, uh, development of technology. But in this particular field, we're primarily um, users of uh, latest technologies, uh, but we do use them in a unique way. Uh, so I think that it gives us uh, some amount of pride to take in trying to get uh, wonderful physics out of our experiments using these technologies, which are pioneered primarily by, um, if we want to give a geographical location to as the Silicon Valley kind of uh, developments. 
So uh, that's what it's based on. And every few years, we, um, uh, we update our electronics, let's say every decade or so. Uh, this one, this particular talk is based on the phase two upgrade of the CMS uh, cap, uh, trigger system. And we just wrote this document called the uh, CMS uh, phase two upgrade uh, level one trigger technical design reports, a rather large term, and I'll try to summarize a few words and focus on the activities that, that my group is involved in primarily as part of the thing. So uh, what is the environment? Well, the environment is really, really a uh, busy environment. Lots and lots of tracks, many, many vertices. In this picture here, every one of these yellow do dots is uh, representing a collision point of uh, 13 uh, TeV proton-proton um, collision. And uh, the result of that is each of those collisions produces many, many particles. There are several thousand particles produced. And those charged particles in that are uh, showing those green traces there. The whole thing is immersed in a uh, 3.8 Tesla magnetic field, but you can barely see the tracks bending. That's because they're all going at a very, very high uh, momentum, right close to the speed of light. And they are very high energy that you can't see the bend even when you get very, very close to the vertex step. Somehow from this, we need to identify the physics of interest where we're usually talking about uh, to particle collision giving a uh, final state of uh, uh, you know up to four typically particles so we have to identify four particles or four uh, clusters of energy uh, coming out of these collisions so that's the task and we need to do it at a very rapid scale so that's what we'll talk about so the proton collisions the uh, the current LHC has uh, uh, runs with about 3,000 bunches uh, in a beam, and each bunch has got about 10 to 11 uh, protons. We're running at 6.5 rather than uh, uh, 7 TeV per beam, so that's 13 TeV collision. And instead of luminosity of uh, uh, 10 to 34, which was our design, we're actually uh, uh, running right now at two times 10 to 34. Uh, and at these luminosities, we have 25 to something on the order of 50 minimal bias events that are happening right now in our detector. Whereas the physics of interest, let's say the production of the Higgs boson, we're talking about selection of very, very rare processes. So the crossing rate is about 40 megahertz and um, you know some bunches are unfilled. So the true rate is something on the order of 32 megahertz. So if you're reading out every event, you're basically reading out at 32 megahertz and each event is uh, a megabyte or more. So that's a ridiculous amount of things. So we somehow have to make that selection and the selection of physics begins uh, at very, very early stages. And in these early stages, we don't, uh, uh, when we discard events, we literally discard them. They're not uh, available for later analysis, unlike a physics analysis software program. So now talking about HLLHC, so uh, the high luminosity point has to do with number of bunches being increased and uh, they're uh, focusing also increased. The energy remains the same, but the net effect is that the luminosity goes up um, probably five times 10 to the 34. So that's going up a uh, little more than a factor of two but it could be 7.5, 10 to 34. So that's what we're talking about. In that situation, we'll have about 200 uh, minimum bias events per crossing, about 10,000 particles are produced. Many of them charged particles, but there are also a lot of neutral particles that are produced photons in these collisions. And uh, here is somehow uh, a little more detail. So uh, this is the nominal design and we're operating at twice the nominal design for the instantaneous luminosity. Uh, whereas uh, at a later time, we'll be operating at almost five times more instantaneous luminosity, which will be unsustainable. So they're coming up with a new idea that there's a level luminosity. Uh, so they're gonna use some accelerator technique to make games a little bit wider. So you always maintain the collision rate of about five times 10 to the 34 uh, in terms of 
instantaneous luminosity and maybe even go up to 7.5. So that's what the HLLHC environment is about. In such an environment, lots of physics processes happen, as I was saying, the minimum bias or the uh, basic inelastic cross-section is very, very high. So it's in milligrams. So the rate of production of events is about 10 to the 17 events. So you need, the, I haven't updated this plot. So this plot is from 10 to 34 luminosity. So you have multiplied by 7.5 for the for this axis. So there are about 10 to 17 uh, interactions happening per second. But as I said, 32 megahertz is the is the uh, is the bunch crossing rate. So that's the rate at which you will see events. And the things of interest are sitting here in uh, in tens of millihertz. Uh, that's the Higgs production processes, if you like, or Higgs production to for uh, for leptons. These are extremely rare processes that we somehow need to get at. So how do we propose to do that? So we have a thing called level one trigger, which is what my fo uh, focus of my talk would be today. And then there are high level triggers as well. Just to give you a scale, since this plot is almost impossible to read, electroweak physics, uh, where Ws and Zs are produced or uh, are exchanged, the rate of that uh, is about seven and a half kilohertz. The top quark production rate, TT bar rate is about 75 hertz. And the Higgs rate would be around a hertz or so. And if you look at the discovery modes, and most of the Higgs decays to BB bar, and if you want to look at four lepton mode in which it is discovered, we're really talking about the rates of about 10 to the minus four. So you get a few events, at, you know, a couple of events a day is what you get, whereas you get 32 megahertz of collation. So somehow we have to reduce them. So in CMS, we do it in two levels, if you like. The first level of reduction is this 32 megahertz down to 700, 750 kilohertz. That's the proposal for HLLFC. Right now we are operating at 100 kilohertz limit. Uh, and the, the high level triggers, these are computer based. And there we go from 750 down to about uh, 10 kilohertz. And we, that is the 10 kilohertz that we can store and take forever to analyze back and forth. So we're still analyzing data that we collected in uh, 2018. We will probably be doing that for some more years. So the idea here is that this is an event store globally accessible. I won't talk about the computing grid and all of that but uh, this is what goes on the computing grid. That already makes many, many petabytes of data, uh, but the processing involved here, you've already made the physics selection of selecting those events which uh, sort of live in the, in the bottom part of this, uh, this area. These are the events that we want to select. And that's not that easy thing to do, okay? So let's see what kind, how do we select these events? So if you want to study the electroweak symmetry breaking uh, physics, let's say Higgs studies and things of that nature, then you can pick out the decays where uh, uh, there are photons or electrons or muons in the up. Those will be low momenta because the Higgs decays, let's say to four muons, then the 125 GV object, you uh, 30 dV or so. So when I say low, I mean 30 GeV here in this context. Whereas if you want to look at some of the uh, more interesting parts of the Higgs couplings that we still need to uh, study carefully, uh, Yukawa couplings, then you produce, uh, you know, because Yukawa coupling is proportional to mass, so the B jets and tau quarks will, uh, tau leptons will be produced. And those are fairly low PT and somehow we need to identify those in the event. Uh, you know, whereas if you want to uh, understand the Higgs mechanism and why the mass is what it is and invoke new TV scale physics uh, to stabilize the Higgs sector and say, let's say talk about Susie or something like that. Then uh, in the parameter space that is left right now, the, uh, the only way to uh, discover this type of new physics is to look for multiple low PT objects or missing transverse energy. Now, uh, you know, these are not easy problems, as you can see. Um, if we want to uh, look at multi TV scale physics, so these will be only loop effects because we're limited by 13 TV. We're not producing this, but there will be. Uh, these heavy particles in the loops, which somehow affect the uh, decays, 
uh, let's say, have flavor changing decays or some very rare decays which are prohibited in standard model, uh, but somehow uh, can can happen in the, beyond the standard model physics. These are physics of B, uh, B quarks usually, or some lepton flavor violating decays of the Higgs and things like that. Again, these require very low PT leptons. The only physics that we can do very easily is mostly ruled out, which is the Pl uh, Planck scale physics. If you're producing things at 13 TeV, the final state objects are many, many uh, things. So these things are already limited by the current uh, uh, LHC to 3 TeV or something like that. So it, uh, there's not much new physics to do here, but in HLI, let's see our focus is primarily on this, maybe a little bit on this. So somehow low PT objects, 30 GV objects need to be extracted out of this kind of uh, very, very messy environment. So what we need to do is we need to select high PT clusters and tracks, high being 30 GV in this context. How do we do that? So this is a small cutout of our detector, uh, just the transverse uh, um, uh, uh, JHM that is shown here. So this is our tracking system, our calorimetry. Uh, this is our three Tesla magnet uh, coil. And then this is the muon system. So the muons, uh, maybe I should have changed the color here, but okay. This is the muon color, uh, uh, muons come out into this part, the, uh, the uh, electrons, of course, have leave a track and they leave an energy deposit. And if they're hadrons, uh, they show up in the in the in the entire calorimeter. They may have a track associated with it. They may not have a track associated with it if they're K longs or some neutral hadrons like neutrons. Uh, photons, of course, interact in the early part of the calorimeter in the electromagnetic calorimeter. So we want to use these kind of uh, um, uh, objects and make cut on the PT. And just relating back to physics for a minute, if you are able to identify, let's say, muons. So here, what we do is this blue, blue line that you see here uh, in the middle here comes in. And because of the four Tesla field, it's bending inside. And then when it is in the return field uh, in, the, in the magnet, which is shown in red here, it bends the other way. Uh, so the muon system uh, uh, has several hits and you can use those hits to make local tracks and you can propagate them to the next level and uh, uh, back and forth if you like, make a matching and then refit the thing and you know what the muon momentum is from this bend. And if you determine the momentum to be about 30 GV or so, you make a tick on this particular histogram here. So if you, uh, and we have simulated this data this is uh, quark production, which I told you is 75 kilohertz. And uh, this is di-Higgs production, which is what we want to look for. If HLLC program is successful, we may see about 100 uh, di-Higgs events where these are produced at 75,000 per second. So the, this arbitrary scale is ridiculously arbitrary, okay? So these are extremely rare things. And most of those di-Higgs is shown in this orange, most of the uh, di-Higgs events have a muon with uh, less than 20 GeV. So we really have to hold the threshold about uh, 30 GeV or so. We can't go any uh, higher than 30 GeV. So these are the moment, uh, momentum that we're interested in. And it turns out that, uh, for instance, if you look at the electrons, uh, if we don't have this inner part of the detector participating in the trigger, the threshold will be about 50 GeV. You throw out most of the data. Whereas if you have the tracking system included in there, you can bring the threshold down to about 30 GeV, which is the kind of thresholds that we want. So the main thing that we have done for the HLLHC case is to bring tracking into the, into the picture and also try to make a better uh, thing. So this is something that we realized a long time ago. I was looking through to, to find a talk from uh, earlier talk that I can look at. And I noticed that uh, my first talk on the high luminosity trigger at that time, it was called Super LHC, was in February 2004, even before we discovered any of these things. And in, in that talk, uh, this is one of the slides in there, which says that uh, the thing that we need is a track trigger and a readout of the crystals. And these two things actually stayed on. I was also hoping that we'll have uh, ability to read out the pixel detector, which has got 10 
10 to the 8 channels or something like that. And that never really materialized. So the track trigger and crystal readout is something uh, that we thought is needed in February 2005. And we even wrote down at the time, play, talk about planning ahead, what are the kind of uh, um, uh, algorithm stages you need. So you need to take the, uh, the, the detector data, which we call trigger primitives, cluster them, correlate them between the tracker and the, and the um, tracker being this thing here, right? This inner part of the tracker. We need to correlate the tracker with the calorimeter and the muon stuff. So that was the idea. And that's the correlating section here. And this structure pretty much stays. So we just, uh, we just uh, from the TDR, now I'm moving on to the newer, uh, newer information. This is from the 2020 TDR that we just finished. And you can see these things, the correlator is right here. And the readout here, we have changed it to uh, the battle calorimeter. We have changed the readout granularity from uh, uh, from the, um, the tower level, as we call. The tower is about uh, 0.087 units in phi and data uh, squares, if you like. Uh, uh, from that, we went down to crystal level. So the new granularity is that uh, in phi and data. That's really, really small amount of information. Uh, uh, size, it's like two and a half centimeters uh, in, uh, in uh, um, X, Y space, if you like, at the location that it is. So that's how fine we are looking at the data in order to select these things. You have to because the multiplicity is ridiculously high. This is the new calorimeter that, uh, uh, the, that I won't talk very much about. It just, it's also called the AG Cal. So that's the high granularity calorimeter, which many people from India are involved in, as, in building also. So that's the new data, but this data, uh, you know, the calorimeter has always participated in the trigger, beyond system always participated in the trigger so far. But this new thing is this tracker uh, uh, information that we added uh, as I thought we need to do in 2004. So that's what we did. Um, and what we can do is that we can take all of this data and uh, make objects out of it and and we can see the algorithms for selecting different kinds of physics if you like based on multiple things so if you look at this jumble of lines i don't mean that you should look at all of them in detail all that i'm trying to say is that the trigger system the object finding and the seeding algorithms are so critical in doing any physics so extracting physics out of the uh, uh, cms detector is no mean task and trigger plays a very crucial role in that. So here's one of the new things that we had to do for upgrading the um, uh, calorimeter readout, if you like, for the thing. So instead of, we used to read out uh, 25 crystals summed together and send the data out. To, so this whole thing is underground on the detector, on the detector in the radiation environment. Right, this whole thing here, from here to here. And these are the optical fibers, which uh, the 90 meters approximately, uh, the optical fibers, which bring the data out to the electronics on the outside. And I'm trying to, I'm going to talk about this electronics if you like. But this is what is at the back of the crystals. There are two APDs, the avalanche prototypes, and then it is, uh, uh, and that is digitized and, uh, and uh, various uh, calibrations are there for that. There are two readouts, if you like, you see the two APDs there. And then it has got a little bit of uh, selection capability in case one of the APD fails. So everything from this point to this point is being upgraded so that we can send out the optical link. At the moment, we are using 1.6 gigabit optical links and we're gonna to change to 10 gigabit per second optical links. That allows us to read out uh, individual crystals, and how many crystals do we have? We have 61,200 crystals. So even if we pack 25 crystals per link, we have about 3,000 optical links with uh, with about 16 gigabit per second uh, uh, data. So it's a lot of data. So that's one upgrade we're doing. And the other thing that we're doing is bring out the tracks. In order to bring out the tracks, we have to start with a new kind of detector and uh, for the tracking system, 
we have only upgraded the uh, the auto tracker if you like this part of the tracker is what is upgraded the uh, i mean we upgrade the whole thing but that's the part which has the track uh, triggering capability so here we divide and conquer if you like both in space and in time so this is the uh, uh, space divisions of, if you look at rotate it and look at the r5 view in this view we split it into a non it uh, each of the nine divisions there. And each of those nine divisions has a slight overlap and the charged particles bend in here. And uh, the idea of this overlap region is so that you can detect those uh, bends which are going away so you can actually tell what the momentum is and uh, to measure the momentum if you like. So the momentum is measured. So these auto tracker, as I was saying, are special detectors. They have double layers, which are separated by a specific uh, dis uh, distance mechanically. Uh, I think that uh, uh, IIT Madras is involved in making these little uh, stuff, uh, separators, if you like little plastic parts, but they're machined uh, there to keep these two uh, silicon chips separated by a specific distance. And that allows you from the bending to determine what the yeah, momentum is. If you select those stubs which are greater than 2 GV or so PT, then you can uh, put them together to form tracklets. And these tracklets can be propagated in and out, just like we talked about in the muon section, uh, to form tracks. And then you can make a fit to that, and then you measure the momentum of this. So this is the kind of thing that we want to do, uh, but we want to do it in, in a very short amount of time. So it's important to know how much data we are talking about. We're talking about 61,000 crystals and maybe up to 2,000 tracks, which are about 2 GV. So that's how we're limiting the number of hits that are read out. And the data rates are ridiculous, right? It is 39,000 gigabit per second for crystals, if you like, and uh, close to 6,000 for others. The total rate is about 62,000 gigabit per second. In order to do that, we uh, organized the detector in various ways, and we're taking data out from the detectors between, uh, 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 you know, but these are older ones, so they're about three gigabit per second to 25 gigabit per second. This kind of technology is enabled uh, by the needs of the communications industry, which we are using right now for the Zoom and things like that. I hope I'm still alive. Uh, I've been talking, talking. Okay, <laughs> so yeah. Um, so now let's talk. A take a little bit of look into what are the things that we have done. So for instance, here's the calorimeter readout. Uh, a pulse in the calorimeter. Uh, we were trying to measure Higgs decay to gamma gamma. Everything is at the end of the day motivated based on physics. So in order to get the Higgs to gamma gamma, it's a huge background from standard model. And the only way you can get it is if you get the mass resolution, the invariant mass of these uh, needs to be uh, having a very good resolution. That means that the energy of the photons needs to be very well measured. In order to measure the energy very well, you want to collect all the light from the crystals. So we delayed the signals in the original thing. And, uh, and uh, if you look here in the scale, the energy spreads out in uh, several hundred nanoseconds and we will close carefully integrating it. And of course, when that happens, you could have two pulses come on top of each other with this many events. So the slower the thing is, the more pile up there will be. So one of the things that we have done is redone this front end electronics. That's what you saw in that CATIA chip and the new ADC that's there. So we changed the uh, shaping of the time so that this is narrower. So we're sacrificing a teeny bit of resolution, but uh, at, uh, and as a as a result of that, we get a fa uh, you know, faster response, and uh, uh, that would reduce the pileup. That's one thing that we did. The other thing is that you know the detector is big. You know, but since the scale of Atlas detector is even bigger, so I use their picture in here. So basically, uh, we're talking about um, uh, several um, uh, nanoseconds of time. Uh, Prop, you know, propagation related time delays from various parts of the detector. It turns out that if you also have TDCs and measure the time very well, we have one more um, uh, ability and that's what we're exploiting. And sometimes it's called 4D reconstruction. Not only did we divide the detector into many 
components and located them in various um, distances from the collision point to get the 3D spatial thing. But we're also looking at the um, time of propagation from the collision point to get a fourth measurement, if you like. So we have added several detectors uh, to dedicate it to do timing, but we've also improved the calorimeter readout, for instance, uh, to include timing information. So those are the kinds of things that we did. Now, uh, I'll move on to talk about how we process that data at this stage. So there are two uh, general purpose uh, ways of processing data. They're based on CPUs and GPUs. We'll talk a little bit, uh, uh, we won't talk about it today, but um, I have one little piece of measure here for that. And the other is the, uh, these things which we are calling FPGAs. So FPGAs are the custom processors and we can actually make these algorithm studies on the scale of microseconds. So for instance, this is the kind of allocation of time that we have. We have about 450 nanoseconds from the time that the tracks arrive uh, to process the and, it, and because we, uh, time, we use time for multiplexing thing, it takes about 450 nanoseconds to read out all the tracks that we have reconstructed in the, uh, uh, in the, uh, from the, coming from the detector. So somehow we need to organize these things. They're all for the same data. And we do that organization in this green thing here. And the time allocated for that is, you know, just a hundred nanoseconds more. And then another uh, few hundred nanoseconds, some of the processing can begin early. So these blue lines are overlapping a little bit, but the total amount of time that we got uh, allocated is about one and a half microseconds. So we need to process the data in one and a half microseconds to analyze the event. Whereas if you do it on a commercial processor, uh, like a, uh, uh, CPU, which is shown here, it takes about a second. And if you use a GPU, which we think is very fast, it takes about 600 milliseconds. So these things are ridiculously slow compared to what we need to take advantage of to the technology that we need to take advantage of to make this happen. So what we're using is high degree of uh, parallelization in order to complete our problem of reconstruction within uh, a few microseconds. So the technology that we're using uh, primarily comes from this company called Xilinx. There used to be another company called Altera, which was bought up by Intel. We haven't been spending too much time on that. Our group is primarily working with the uh, uh, Xilinx programmable uh, chips. And I will talk about that uh, in the rest of my talk, what we're doing. So in phase one, we built uh, phase one this few years ago. We built uh, hardware uh, using these chips called Vertex 7 chips. That's in use right now, it works very well. And uh, in phase two, we've selected this uh, newer product that they have. And what it allows one to do is, you know, um, IO is a very important thing. So this can uh, tackle things at 32 gigabit per second, right? That's what the uh, input is. This is uh, these ultra scale plus chips have several hundred of these, uh, no, not several hundred, I mean, a hundred of these uh, 32 gigabit per second capable uh, uh, serial IO capability. It also has a lot of logic cells. This is about 4 million logic cells, if you like. So there's a lot of processing that can be done and the processing can proceed at uh, fairly rapid uh, clock speeds, like 360 megahertz or something like that. So that's what we're looking at. The other important component is optoelectronics. Um, now, uh, this is a big deal as well. We want to transmit data and we need thousands of fibers which are connected to take data and we want them to go to 25 gigabit per second. So these need to be small because we want to put several of those on one card. So these miniature components from companies like Samtech, what it allows you to do, this particular link, if you like, you know, the scale here is centimeters. Uh, what this can carry is up to uh, 12 uh, optical links in this little package here, which is less than a centimeter, if you like, in the size. 
and uh, the, it can carry 12 times 25 gigabit per second. So this is the technology that we're using to bring the data in, and this is the technology we're using to process the data. So we formed a group of uh, institutions some years ago, and it's growing. TFR is a member of that institution as, uh, in this group as well, and we call our consortium the AP Consortium for the Advanced Processor Consortium. And uh, we built um, uh, a new card with that. Uh, here's a picture of that card. Uh, this card has got several things. It has one of those uh, big FPGAs, which you cannot see because it's under this copper uh, heat sink, if you like. So we even designed the heat sink ourselves. And uh, it has another uh, chip from uh, Xilinx, uh, which is called a zinc chip. And this zinc chip is is, is much smaller version uh, of uh, this. Uh, VU9P is the, the ultra scale plus processor that we're using. Um, this is a much smaller version of that. Plus, it also has an ARM processor with Linux on it. Okay, uh, so that's the Linux part that I'm talking about. And then it's got another part here, uh, which TFR built for us. This also has a little zinc chip on it. And what it does is it's able to monitor the voltages and uh, temperatures and uh, all sorts of excursions that may happen and automatically control the power distribution and things like that on the board so that these components remain safe. Uh, the, the development cost of these things is ridiculously high. Um, uh, the, the BU9P chips are not inexpensive. Each of these is a few thousand dollars, so we really have to be careful. And this IPMC is the device which keeps the board, uh, 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 you know, uh, safe, if you like. And here's another board that uh, TFR built for us. Uh, this board is called the ES. Oh, sorry, not that one. This one. This is called the ESM, and this is basically a little switch. So it's got a Linux here, and it's got another thing over here, which has got, uh, um, uh, you know, there's another zinc chip here. So all sorts of uh, switching is needed. So there's a built-in little card for the switch there. So this, these two things, ESM and the uh, IPMC, were built by TFR Group for us. So we built eight of these APD boards. Each of them have got 128 gig optical links. Some of these links, you know, so these, these are the SAMTEC components, each of this, right? There are several of these SAMTEC components that are integrated into it. Each of them carries about, uh, um, you know, in this particular case, four plus four, eight links. And those optical fibers are routed to the front here. But it turns out only 76 of them could fit on this part of the board. And because we left out an empty space here for some other purpose. Uh, and uh, University of Florida, uh, and we together built another ex uh, card for that called the Rare Transition Module, which also has these things. I believe TFR helped them design the fiber harness for this part as well. So there's a lot of participation by worldwide community in developing these cards. And uh, um, I'm happy to uh, have made this connection between the TFR group and uh, and our, our group, and we were able to produce this. So this particular card, uh, you know, works in the LHC environment with its 40 megahertz clock, and of course internally it will multiply very high. Uh, so it needs a very good time base, which is coming from uh, uh, from one of our existing cards there. So we produce eight of these boards, and we've made lots of testing. So I can tell you a little bit about that. So we put. Uh, six of the boards together like this, and we ran it with 528 links uh, at this uh, multiple of the LHC speed, if you like. And uh, these things were running for a significant period of time uh, with limited number of errors. So we actually know that we can build a system and send data around. So this is how it looks physically, like a bunch of hair, if you like. In, uh, in these pictures here. So there are four cards, which are talking to two other cards, which are on the side of this crate. So this format of the crate is called ATCA crate. But that's not enough. Just sending the data is not enough. You need to do more with it. So here we started a new paradigm for firmware development. 
controlling these FPGAs is a lot of work. You need to program in uh, um, in BHDL, which mostly engineers know, uh, because you need to worry about the time sequencing of signals as well, which is quite painful, not just the physics part of it, which, which we define in C++ easily, but uh, VHDL requires that we also need to know where the digital signals are propagating on the car. So we don't want engineers to be uh, spending all their time learning about what physicists want to do and write up very complicated packages. So Xilinx uh, has a system uh, that they developed for this high level programming language support. So what we did is I took advantage of that and wrote some core firmware. What the uh, firmware shell does is that uh, it isolates the algorithm part and the rest of it is implemented by our engineering team. So there are two chips, as I told you, one chip, uh, uh, the Zinc chip has got an ARM processor and a programmable logic part, which is like a Kintex uh, chip. So the ARM processor runs Linux and this part, the programmable logic connects with the main chip. So this is what, this is the control path, if you like, of how to program things and so on and so forth. And you can also do monitoring this way. And the fast data though, comes on optical links in and goes out on optical links. And we put in, in the, in the core firmware shell buffers in here. So the, this one receives and this one sets it up for transfer, but we put buffers in there. And the buffers can be programmed from Linux, if you like. And what it allows us to do is isolate the algorithm part of it. And the algorithm part we're developing using uh, C++ and languages like that. And people who are developing are physicists who understand the science that I talked about on the first half of the talk. And what we do is use the system to do uh, 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 a nice collaborative way, develop firmware so that we uh, we make things effectively. I think we can skip this. This has a little more detail of what it says. So if you look at the, the utilization of the uh, of the FPGA, the VU9P that we're using, uh, yeah, we're supporting all the uh, all the links. That's hundred links. Oops, there are hundred links are supported, and but most of the chip. If you look, all this black region is empty. Nothing is happening there. So all of that is left for the algorithm. The utilization is 99% on, uh, on the gigabit links, but for the rest of the utilization, it's only at the level of a few percent. So we saved all the logic for algorithms in our uh, APD uh, uh, card. So we put together several test systems. One test system we put together using our first uh, we have phase one cards, which are based on Vertex 7. And uh, now we have um, uh, uh, test setups using the new APD car. So for instance, uh, this HLS block uh, can be programmed or we can have a little bit of control. The users can write a little bit of VHDL to sequence the data and do the rest of it in the block. So here's something that uh, the University of Hyderabad people have done for us lately. This was a presentation from one of their students, Piyush, la uh, last week. Uh, so he did a bitonic sorting algorithm. So what his little algorithm does, which he illustrates here, is that it takes 32-bit input uh, from uh, several um, blocks and, uh, and he implements it. So the algorithm itself, if you look at it, the core part of the algorithm looks like this. And it's running at uh, 340 megahertz. And all it is doing is comparing here in this little thing. So the algorithm is written in C++. And uh, you click a button and lo and behold, you get uh, a, an implementation for the FPGA. And it takes nine clock ticks and each clock tick is 1.9 nanoseconds. So he basically managed to get in about uh, um, a, 17 nanoseconds managed to sort these 32 objects down to uh, a, in, a, in a ascending order of momentum or something like that, right? And it takes a very, very small percentage of the uh, resources uh, that are there in the system. 
So uh, a beginning programmer could actually write software like this. Of course, what we want to do is a bit more complicated than this, but small pieces can be done like this and put together. Uh, this is what we really want to do. We want to take the eight of five space of the detector. It's got lots and lots of hits. And the size of these uh, squares here is telling you how much energy there is. But it turns out in some regions, there are clusters, right? There are clusters here. And what we need to do is identify those clusters. Those particles are interesting. And we also want to identify that many of these things are coming from different bunch crossings. You remember the picture that I showed with lots of vertices on it. So we want to eliminate that. So there's a salt and pepper background, as you would call it. You want to get rid of that. And the algorithm for that is called puppy. And rest of it, we want to cluster and uh, correlate tracks with it and find these energy deposits. And it turns out we want to convert this eight of five spectrum into this. And now we can take a few objects. And this is probably an event where uh, several jets are produced. And, uh, and how do we do this? Well, it turns out that this code was also done. And this is the same timing diagram that I showed before. We want to do it in 1.5 microseconds. So you divide it in time and space, if you like, and conquer the problem. And that's what they have done. And what they've shown is that using about 20 to 30% of the resources of this FPGA, the VU9P, we can actually reconstruct uh, the event just like uh, you know the, the same, uh, these things are taking on the order of 1.5 microseconds. And we are able to use 20 to 30% of this chip and, and uh, identify what are the objects which went into that. Um, uh, so I'll conclude here, just telling you things. So a team of engineers and physicists, uh, I'll just read it, are taming the LSC data deluge uh, using communication technologies. And this is what will enable fundamental discoveries, oops, sorry, uh, in the coming uh, few decades at the HLLFC. Um, I think these advances we need to follow uh, routinely, and that's what is enabling us to do more and more as time passes. And it turns out that students and postdocs are also able to participate in this and get good training, especially writing algorithmic software, uh, and that will help them for their careers, both in academia and industry. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, our engineering team, Tom Gorski, who's our lead engineer who designed all these cards, Alas Shvetek, who did bulk of the uh, firmware design, the core firmware. Jesra Tikalski is the one who did um, uh, Linux related control and monitoring uh, using the zinc chip. Uh, Bob Forbes is our super tech who knows how to put these fine uh, components together in a nice way. Luis Moreno from Princeton joined us and he is also able to help with that. Uh, as I said, some of these small parts, uh, uh, benzene cars were built by TFR, Mandakini and Kushal, thank you. And uh, I have lots of physics collaborators here, some of them. Uh, let's go. Okay. I hope I didn't take okay. too long. Yeah, thank you very much, Sridhara. This is uh, a very, very interesting talk uh, in the whole series. I I should say in some way, Bear, uh, you kind of brought about two, uh, you know, to the uh, very clearly uh, the role of uh, modern technologies, if I can use that uh, word, particularly the in the electronics and uh, more specifically uh, in the uh, FPGAs and the communication chips, which had made a tremendous uh, difference to uh, you know what you could think of doing online. I mean, for example, just taking only on the trigger where uh, it was only triggered based on a very course kind of uh, information now uh, coming on to actually triggering based on trackers and so on, which uh, I mean, you in fact saw uh, talked about thousands of channels and the way you process some of the objects at, you know, maybe under 10 nanoseconds or maybe a couple of tens of nanoseconds. Uh, this is something which has brought in, I think, a huge advancement. And uh, needless to also say, uh, as we also mentioned in the beginning, uh, the interdisciplinarity and the real marriage of uh, 
physicists and engineers has brought out uh, so much out of what from the same machine and what you could actually do online and also bringing up the new physics objects. It is a, a fantastic uh, you know, playground where I think the engineers uh, had a, a big role to play. And of course, it's also an opportunity for physicists to think of what new physics that we can think of. And the way you started by saying the segmentation of the detector has gone into few centimeters now, he really says uh, where we are heading to in the high luminosity uh, regime. And uh, we are very, really thankful to you to bring out that real, uh, you know, what I can say, interdisciplinary kind of work, uh, as well as the technology spin-offs uh, that comes to physics. Um, there are quite a few questions. I'm sure I already am seeing it on the YouTube, and I'm sure there will be more questions probably also. So those who are on the uh, Zoom, please uh, raise your hand, and I will come back to you. Uh, take up one question at a time. But by the time that comes up, let me take, uh, let me start with questions from uh, YouTube. Uh, we have a couple of physics questions to begin with. Uh, one Sadashiv Sahu, uh, he asks you like in pile up uh, slide, I mean your pile up, uh, the where you actually shown the pile up. Uh, since PP bar, BB bar, I'm sorry, is one of the prominent decay channels of Higgs, uh, how pileup is managed in the BB bar DK channel? So first off, uh, in this particular um, uh, triggering uh, thing, maybe I should go and uh, show this slide for a second. Okay, so uh, where is the focus of trigger? The focus of the trigger system is to define these objects, right? So if you want to look at, let's say, Higgs to BB bar, which is this yellow thing here, it depends on uh, hadronic physics. So it depends on the jets. It depends on VBF. By VBF, what we mean is that you have uh, uh, W boson, uh, W plus W minus fusing and making the Higgs, and the Higgs decays to BB bar. But we don't have a beam of W plus and W minus. We have a beam of proton, and the proton splits up, and you get a quark here, and you get a quark here. These two quarks are coming from two different protons, so there is no color connection. So they will be isolated uh, high PT jets. These are forward look going jets. So the vector boson fusion process is characterized by two quarks and a BB bar. So what we're trying to do is find an event with two quarks, which are going forward region. So jets, which are separated by large eta and two B quarks produced in the middle. So you have to do a topological analysis of the, um, of the system. So what the trigger is doing is finding all the objects and reporting them. And what we're going to do is in order to identify this particular thing, we will require that there are two B jets and there are uh, uh, two other jets going in the forward region with a delta eta separation. And once you've subtracted off the pileup, rest of it is quiet. That's what we want to know that we want to do. So that's why this PF plus puppy, as we call it, is important. That puppy part is the pileup mitigation algorithm. So pileup mitigation plays a very important role in this because. Uh, QCD produces lots and lots of jets. And if you overlap many events, you'll get lots of four jet events. So not only do we have to uh, figure out that uh, there are four jets in it, uh, they need to all come from the same vertex. They need to uh, have a significant amount of energy. So those are the kinds of things that we're doing. Try to keep the answer shorter in future. But... <laughs> sure. Uh, here is a question from K. Ramachandran. Uh... Chandran, uh, go ahead and ask. Yeah. Uh, so when you were saying about like kind of 30 GV minimum threshold and all, like uh, there are many things, but one of them was 30 GV. So if you see those kind of things, you have hundreds of particles coming. So that 30 is individual or all summed together is 30 GV as an example. No, no, this is an individual muon of 30 GV. And we are measuring the mo momentum of the muon by measuring this uh, track. 
and uh, and fitting it. So what we're doing is, for instance, in this particular muon, there is a, a at the local detector level, you can identify that it went in this direction. Let's see if I can change the color of this. Uh, I can't. Um, uh, here the track went this way. Here it went this way. Here it went up further up and here it went further up. So you can make a fit of that. And once you have the fit, you know what the momentum is. And that momentum is what is plotted here. This is the momentum identified for the particles uh, by their bend. And uh, it's a muon, it made a track in this region. That by itself, if you look at the muon resolution by looking at just this part, the resolution will be on the order of 30%. And that's not good enough to make a nice cut because 30% of, uh, of, you know, the 20 GV muon will, look, will end up being passing the 30 GV threshold. We don't want that to happen. So what we have done in the HLLHC is to also look at tracking here. So what we're doing is that we're matching the momentum measurement here where we can measure to a few percent, like 1% or so, uh, you can measure the momentum here. That muon, 1%, Track here, we don't know it's a muon. We just know that there's a track with uh, to 30 GV to 1%. We're going to propagate it and match with this. And that's what the correlator is doing. So now we measure the momentum to 1% for a single track. And we know that it's a muon. And then we plot it here. And even for that, the rate is ridiculously high. If you look here, we produce 42,000 such things uh, per second. And uh, it turns out that a very small fraction of those are from, uh, um, uh, are from interesting physics. So you have to keep the threshold down that way. So it is a single track threshold. Thank you. Yeah. Pritam uh, Palit, please ask your question. Hello? Yeah, we yeah. can hear you. Okay. Uh, so, so can you go to the uh, track finder? Uh, I mean, th that slide. I mean, where you are you are dividing the R five plane into uh, non ends. Oh, that's the track thing. Yes, track finder. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so my question is that why exactly non end? Uh, I mean, uh, this non end. I mean, it's nine uh, division, and uh, I mean. Uh, and how do you exactly combine this, uh, I mean, information from this non-end? And what is the difference? Uh, I, mean, I mean, does it follow the uh, similar procedure in HLT track finding also? So uh, the key to many of these uh, things is how do you get the data to one place, right? That's what you need. For the HLT, so uh, the bulk of this picture uh, his picture is dominated by these things called DTC. Those are actually uh, uh, read out uh, uh, aspects of it. It's just controlling where the data goes, where, where things are going. And that's a very important part of this. Now, why not uh, non you said? Well, you know, ideally, if you can put all the resources in one place, you would. But the FPGAs are not big enough to, to process the entire uh, uh, 360 degrees. So we just estimated that if you divide and conquer, that's what I meant by this thing here, where I say, well, yeah, come out, it's, it's not. Oops. Ah. Uh, this iPad is this yeah, be. sorry about that. Uh, I think this slide. Okay. So when I say divide and conquer in space and time, what I meant is that in order to fit within the, uh, within the, uh, uh resource available in this VU9P chips, if you like. What we determined is that the amount of resources that we need are several hundred of these chips. So how do we do that? So what we did is we divided it into nine pieces in, in geometrical space here. And then we took 18 of these time slices, if you like. So each event is processed in, in a separate one of these things. We're only looking at one ninth of the data in space 
and the particle can bend in that. That's what, uh, you know, if it is fully contained, you can measure it. But if it comes out and goes here, this is too low a momentum. We don't need to measure it so we can drop it. Whereas if you get another one, which is going close to that at the end, you want to get the hits on the neighboring side. So we put a little bit of overlap possibility and it, the division into these nines and 18s are simply to do with how much resources you need in electronics to do the work. Uh, it's multiple types of resources, right? There are resources about how much data comes in. That is number of fibers that you can have. In the card that we built, you only have 100 fibers 100 that you can have. Fibers you cannot you put any more data, data than that. More data than that. Gone. That's gone. Okay. I hope I answered your question. I hope I answered your question. No, no Atil, uh, and another question that, uh, I mean, the, the, uh, I mean, how do, I mean, uh, does it just follow, I mean, uh, like in RAN2, uh, in RAN2, L1 trigger does not have any tracking uh, system, but HLT has. Uh, then, uh, I yeah, mean, but in HLT, HLT, we're reading, reading out the, reading out the, in, in HLT, it's we're, it's reading HLT we're reading out the entire out detector, the entire and, detector and, and we're processing, and processing in millisecond time. Millisecond time. Yeah. Okay. Right. So larger time. Right. So if you yeah. want to process in nanosecond, process nanosecond time scale, scale, you need to process scale, every event. Process every event. Okay. In HLT, okay. we HL... only process the events which have passed the level one. So the event rate is no longer 32 megahertz that you need to process, 40 megahertz if you like, that needs to be processed. And so 40 megahertz, you're only looking at 100 kilohertz. That you can do in a computer. I thought I had a slide there, but let me... Uh, Go back to that for a second. <clears throat> yeah, this slide, right? So as you can see, this is the HLT thing. So right now in the HLT, if you take the HLLHC event, it will take one second to process. Uh, if you want to process at one second, the number of events that are coming out at 32 megahertz, you need 32,000 uh, uh, such things to process, <laughs> right? That is not going, 32 million such processors to process. We don't want 32 million computers, so we have to do differently. Now, if, even if you use GPUs, which are cheaper than CPUs, it's still going to be ridiculously uh, expensive to do that, assuming you can get all the data out to start with, right? So the, that's why the HLT land, what we did is that we reduced the rate down to 100 kilohertz, and then you can you, uh, buy thousands of uh, CPUs to do it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, can I ask the last question? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, so can you go to the, I mean, the, uh, I mean, the uh, latency of the different detectors like uh, E cal, H cal, H cal. Latency? Yes. Yeah, I mean, you are, you are showing like, uh, I mean, uh, uh, let's see, which uh, slide are you talking about? Are you talking e cal, H cal. I didn't realize that I, I had latency. I had latency. Uh, Love to see. Love to see. Maybe it's in one of these Maybe tables. It's in one of these tables. Yes, uh, yes, I think uh, the uh, yes. No, I think uh, uh, the the later one. I think. This one? Oh yeah, this, this one, one has. Oh laid. yeah, this one has laid. Yes, yes. Uh, so actually, I mean, how does? So how does this? I mean, the H cal or H F these things? I mean, differ. I mean, that H cal or H cal. I mean, for H cal we are uh, taking. Uh, I mean, latency is uh, five mu second, but H cal is one point five. I mean. How does this differ actually? So if you so look at the processing at... thing here, this is for the battle calorimeter and it's sequential processing that you see that's listed here. And for each crystal, we're reading out the output and we're sending it out. That's easy to do. Each crystal has a size as we were talking about which is uh, on the order of 0. 0.0025, uh, no, I have two five. 0. 0.025 two five. in the uh, five is the in five, okay? Whereas in the edgy cal, uh, in the forward region, for some reason, 
they went to even finer granularity than that. So that just means that you have lots and lots of readouts. On top of it, this one uh, is 25 radiation lengths and 25 zero, there's just one number coming out. Whereas in the EDGCAL, it's a sampling calorimeter, you're reading many, many segments and, and that's what the EDG stands for, the high granularity. Because of that, there are lots of little pieces of information that need to be put together from neighboring regions to identify a cluster. Uh, and in order to do that, it takes time and effort. And that's what is, is what you're seeing in here, uh, that it takes quite a bit of time to form the AGCAL trigger primitives. If you look at the number of readout cells of HGCAL, it's very, very large, and we reduced it down to something smaller. Maybe it's in here, right? The HGCAL, uh, you can see the towers and crystals, right? So uh, the number of readout channels is much, much higher than this. Okay, so somehow the clusters are formed, and that takes time. Okay, thanks. Okay, okay. Uh, let's go to uh, once again to YouTube. Uh, we have another uh, physics question that could you please explain a little more about how it's helpful in delaying signal of gamma gamma channel in Higgs detections? Um, I'm not sure I understood the question. Uh, could you repeat the question? Could you please explain a little more about how it's helpful in delaying signal of gamma gamma channel in Higgs detections? Uh, uh, not... I don't know what you mean, but what I'll do is I'll explain how the Higgs to gamma gamma works. Okay. Uh, if you want to trigger on Higgs to yeah, gamma. Yeah, maybe he can type in in case. Uh... Yeah, so somewhere in here, uh, in this gigantic collision, let's say one of those vertices is where the Higgs boson is produced and it decays to two photons. So what we have, if you look at your final diagram, uh, uh, is basically that you have a gluon uh, and a gluon and they fuse and you have a loop of TT bar and you made a Higgs and that Higgs uh, decayed into two high energy photons. Now the gluon that the proton came from broke up and then a lot of particles are produced, low energy particles. So these are a few GV particles that are all, uh, all over the detector. And then there are gazillion other things, which is mostly uh, too many processes which are producing all sorts of particles and stuff. So these two photons, are embedded in there. In this picture, you won't even see them because photons are uh, chargeless. Therefore, they will not ionize the, uh, um, the diodes that our detector is made of. So you won't even see that those photons are there. So here we won't see them. What happens is the photon, maybe I will expand this a little bit so you can see it. So the photon is indicated by this dashed line because you haven't actually detected it in the tracking parts of the system. So the, here it is all in dashed line, right? You haven't detected that red line. But what you observe is this isolated electromagnetic cluster. So the code that we run on our FPGA needs to find a cluster of electromagnetic energy. And then it should look at all the tracks and say that none of the high momentum tracks, we know that this cluster has got about 50 GeV uh, energy. And that 50 GeV energy should have a nice 50 GeV straight, almost straight going track pointing towards the back. And there is no track. That's when you identify that it's a photon. And if you have two of those in an event and they're almost back to back, then we call that a photon trigger. And that's what is done in the in, in the thing here. So that's the photon triggers. And if there are two of those photon trigger objects, then it will, uh, it will produce the trigger for the Higgs to gamma gamma. Okay. 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 Last one. Uh, that's nice. Okay. Uh, 
question that probably you have mentioned somewhere, but okay. Uh, by how much factor the number of collisions can be increased after high luminosity LHC upgrade? I, I'm not sure. You must have mentioned this. So number. I had that in the early slides. So. Okay. So uh, it's, uh, basically, uh, the design was about 1 times 10 to the 34. So this is all in the units of 10 to the 34. Uh, and for HLLC period of time, uh, the idea is to increase the uh, particle count and also decrease the uh, emittances of the beam so that the luminosity, the instantaneous luminosity goes to on the order of 10 times higher than the nominal. We're all, we're already operating twice the nominal twice. instantaneous luminosity. And this would be 10 times as much. And this would be very, very difficult for the detectors to survive in. But it turns out that if you look at the lifetime of the beam, which is on the order of about 12 hours or so, in those 12 hours, you have an exponential decay of the thing. Now, we start from, uh, as I said, uh, at um, uh, 2 times 10 to the 34 right now, when it goes down to something on the order of uh, uh, 10 to the 33 you know, by the time 12 hours happen. So instead of letting that happen, what we're trying to do is we play with these things so that the beam instantaneous do doesn't go very high, but you'll extend the, uh, the lifetime of the thing by instead of having a slope, you try to keep it constant for a long period of time and get to about five times 10 to the 34. So it's a complicated answer because we're trying to increase it by uh, increase it, but also flatten it, if you like, not that different from the COVID flattening that we're going through right now. The idea is to last longer and mm -hmm. um, keep the luminosity leveled at about five times 10 to the 34. And there's also hope on some people's part that we go to seven and a half times 10 and 34. Uh, yeah. Uh, so, Sridhar, okay, we just have one question came up. Uh, this is Praveen. Yeah, please ask your question. Hi, Dr. Uh, may I know, like, uh, from which company that you ordered the Cathia chips? Which, can you, can you say it loud a bit? From which company? Uh, I, am I audible? Ah, yeah, you? now better. Yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, from which company, like the Cathia chips are ordered? So the, those are uh, custom, custom ASIC. Hmm. The okay. Cathia chips are custom ASICs. They're made uh, by uh, uh, by the Italian group. Um, I don't know which company they're working with. Um, but if I were to guess, it is probably one of the Japanese uh, companies that they had been working in the past with Hamamatsu, probably. Hamamatsu. They do a custom development of the ASIC. So this is a custom ASIC. I don't know if it is the Italians. I think it is the Italians who are building this for the... Uh... Okay. Okay. Uh, okay, and then... Uh, uh... As the uh, as we come to the uh, the rates of the uh, different objects productions, particularly the top uh, quarks uh, produced at the 75 hertz, as a, in comparison with the uh, Higgs is like one hertz in comparison in, in comparison with the 32 megahertz, is, is it still the LHC mission is still a top factory and like do we have enough uh, Higgs uh, events to do a precise uh, uh, Higgs property measurements? Well, uh, the goal because the is... order is like a, a six orders of magnitude lesser. I do agree that we need a statistically uh, viable, uh, you know, fair amount of data to authenticate the accuracy and to minimize the systematics and I mean, like statistic. I mean, the errors, uh, the statistical errors, right? Isn't it? So if you uh, if we can get a clean enough environment. Uh, for uh, controlling the systematics, that would be great. Unfortunately, at the HLLHC, you'll see a lots and lots of background. So at the moment, six to gamma gamma and four lepton channels are definitely limited by statistics. So getting more data is not, not a problem. 
But Higgs production is, you know, each of these is two orders of magnitude higher, and most of it is going to be B bar, right? Yeah. So uh, if you want to measure B B bar, we're thinking that we can measure it to about ten uh, percent or so. If you want to measure tau tau, uh, we have to look at the booster part of the thing. If the theoretical correct uh, uncertainties are controlled, and if you're using B B F production for this. We may be able to measure uh, tau tau to better than 10%, but the jury is out on those things within tau tau and BB bar. So we may be able to measure some of these larger couplings to 10%. There are people who are adventurous enough to think that we'd be able to do CCBR as well, but I doubt it. Now, mu plus mu minus, uh, you just saw the result at the IHF conference, and uh -huh. uh, obviously that is a uh, a, a, that's primarily driven by how well you can measure the uh, muon momenta, and yeah. it's only going to get better. So I think that uh, mu plus mu minus mu carbon coupling we can probably measure significantly better. And there again, it's uh, uh, you know there is a lot of background, but still uh, the resolution helps, and that resolution doesn't get worse. So uh, there's a good chance that we can do it. Okay, and uh, one more final question. I mean, uh, this uh, radiation, I mean, all this uh, uh, hardware, like this, uh, the, the circuitry is uh, placing almost close to the proximity to the beam line. And how about this radiation tolerance as far as the uh, optical fiber cables is concerned? Is it like, is it not a matter of a concern? Um, hey, yeah, but most of this uh, is not in the radiation environment. If you if you look at the uh, unfortunately I don't have a picture here showing what is located where um, yeah so uh, so in this thing uh, in this thing this is of course the detector right so it's on the detector yeah these things. These boards, these three boards, the CATIA board, the ADC board, and the LPGBT board, okay. they're all sitting on the detector okay. at yeah. the back of the calorimeter. So the radiation okay. environment there is pretty bad. And, yeah. uh, and that's the reason why these boards and the ASICs on them are custom designed so that they have built-in radiation tolerance and they've been tested to do that. This particular gigabit transmitter is a custom design one. It's not an FPGA. This is not on an FPGA for a good reason. These are ADCs that we're making. Uh, these are uh, ASICs that we're making so that they're radiation tolerant. Okay. The data is received, and this thing is in a room which is 90 meters away. I think I referred to that earlier yeah. right? so, a yeah. time ago. And that's coming on these large, long optical fibers. The optical yeah. fibers themselves are not uh, are not a big deal. They're not going to black and other anything. But uh, but the uh, but the electronics itself could have uh, radiation uh, issues. So we built you know uh, carefully these chips, and some of these chips have got redundant circuitry so that there's majority logic to avoid um, uh, block Latch up conditions due to the, yeah. Yeah, okay. And uh, final question, like, you know, the TFR is prepare, prepared the zinc uh, circuitry and then the, uh, 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 like, where does it, uh, like, uh, uh, the fabrication ha uh, been uh, uh, taken place? Like, you know, uh, TFR is involved. I don't in remember the name of the company, some company in Bangalore or Pune, I forgot. Uh, okay. Yeah, I think it is in Bangalore. Uh, I also don't know exactly, but I think it is in Bangalore. Okay, okay, okay. That sounds good. Thank you very much for your very interesting and uh, impressive talk. Okay, uh, so Sridhar, I don't uh, see any more questions. So I think now it is time uh, for me to thank you on behalf of all the participants for uh, this really excellent talk uh, uh, that has connected, as I said, uh, you know, the future physics that we can expect with the high luminosity regime of CMS, but uh, using all the, uh, you know, the technology that you talked uh, very much in detail. Uh, so thanks once again, and uh, I hope it's also useful for not only the physicists, but also lots of engineers who are working in this high technology areas.
So with that, uh, let me once again thank you for taking your time. Uh, uh, of course, this is a raw, you know, odd uh, uh, time zones, but uh, you still agreed to give this talk uh, today. Thank you very oh, much. No problem. It's well, nice and early in the morning. Time for a coffee now. <laughs> okay. Thank you very. Yeah, thank you very much, and thank you for paying attention. I hope yeah. it was yes. Yeah. Okay. Take care and Bye. stay safe. Bye. Uh, Bye. So before I just close the meeting, once again, I will. Uh, I would like to announced that the next talk uh, we have is on Friday at 6 p.m. Uh, Professor Neelmani Mathur from TIFR Mumbai is going to speak on the on the uh, beautiful, charming, exotic hydrons, so the tetrapack, uh, the quarks, and uh, the, let's see, the results. Okay, so please come back and join at 6 p.m. on Friday. Thank you. Thank you very much and good night. <laughs>